Abraham experienced it and his name was changed. Sarah experienced it and she got laughter. Moses experienced it and he went from hiding to leading. David experienced it and became God's beloved. Elijah experienced it and brought down fire. A savior has come to you. A healer has come to you. A deliverer has come to you. A redeemer has come to you. You will not miss your miracle. Now, it's your time. Experience the supernatural in this month's Global Crusade themed The Glorious Visitation of Christ happening live in Ghana. God is ready to move. Also featuring our ministers, church workers and professional conference team enabling grace and power for the end time harvest. The youth aren't left behind as they are moving upward to higher heights with the Impact Academy. Join us from the 28th to 25th of April at Independence Square, Osu, Accra. The word of power would be broadcast worldwide through satellite, radio, TV, and the GCK social media platforms. We will be blessed by glorious music from choirs around the world. Praise the Lord. We are in Joshua and we're still in Joshua today. Are you getting something from this Joshua? Let's close our eyes for prayer. Our Father, we thank you very much for your goodness. Thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for your children. And thank you for the thirst, the interest you've given us in your word. We're praying, O oh Lord, you enrich our understanding of scripture today in Jesus' name. Make us better workers, better leaders, effective shepherds and pastors in the vineyard of the Lord in Jesus' name. We pray that the work we do will do with spiritual wisdom and will be rewarded at last. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. We are back to Joshua, and today we are in chapter 2. I just want to remind you, we've uh, done three studies in Joshua chapter 1. And in Joshua chapter 1, in the beginning verses, we learned about the patience of Joshua. That even though uh, Moses had laid hands on him, and had commissioned him, and God had specifically said... He will be the one to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. After the death of uh, Moses, he waited patiently, teaching us a lesson that although we may have the will of God for our lives and the commission that we ought to go through, yet patience is very important. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 18. Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, there are times God will wait so that he will test our patience. And deliberately, he may even delay some things. And then we are told, he, do, he does that so that he will be gracious unto you. Therefore, will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Listen to the last part now. Blessed are all they that wait for him. And uh, we we'll see that uh, Joshua became blessed. He waited while the Lord was waiting until the Lord said, Arise, go over this Jordan and lead the people of God over Jordan. And then we learned in our second study that the Lord encouraged him and he said, Be strong and of a good courage. And then he told him something which is telling every one of us that this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You'll meditate therein day and night so that you'll prosper as you observe to do according to what is written therein that you find already had been written in deuteronomy deuteronomy chapter 17 we're reading there from verse 18 it says and it shall be when he seated upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. It's talking about when uh, Israel will become a kingdom. And they will choose kings for themselves. The king will do this peculiar thing. He himself, because there was no printing at that time, he will copy the book of the law. What will he do with it? In verse 19, and it shall be with him. 
that he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and to keep all the words of this law and these statutes, and to do them. That's exactly what God told Joshua. You are now leading the people of God, and there is one important duty for you. You must be committed to the truth of the word of God. Then we came to the last part of Joshua chapter 1. In the last part of Joshua chapter 1, from verse 10, I showed you last week that um, Joshua commanded the officers. And the officers commanded the people. And you see the word command, commanders, commanded, commandment. You see that it appeared uh, about nine times in those uh, verses. And uh, it's the same thing today. There must be law and order in society. Teachers will command students. That's normal. Fathers will command their children. That's normal. And the commander will command the troop. That's normal. And the pastor will command members in the church. That's the order that God has given. And God will give grace to the members to be obedient. As he will give grace to the wife to be obedient to the husband. It is not the other way around. God will not give the husband the grace to be submissive to the wife. That's not God's order. God will not give grace to the father to be submissive to the children. That's not God's order. God will not give the pastor grace to be submissive to the members. That's not God's order. What's God's order? You have the shepherd over the flock. You have the pilot over the passengers. You have the captain over the troops. You have the husband over the wife. And you have the teacher over the students. You have the pastor over the members. And God will give us grace so that we'll be obedient to the word of God we're learning in the church in Jesus' name. Now we come to the study of today. We're looking at Joshua chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 1 through to verse 7. I'll read it later to save time because we'll still uh, interpret verse by verse. But the uh, passage there is telling us that Joshua sent out spies. And those spies came to Jericho. And they came to the house of Rahab. Well, uh, you wonder what we're going to get from such a passage like this. God's word is a book of wisdom, giving us divine blueprints for living a successful life. While the word of God teaches us not to lean upon our understanding, but to trust in God. At the same time, the word of God encourages us that we should not throw away common sense in performing the duty that God had given us. We need to emphasize that because there may be people wondering, since God had told Joshua, arise, go over this Jordan and possess the land. Every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you from the river unto the uh, borders of Egypt. I've given everything to you. Be courageous. Have I not chosen you? Have I not commanded you? Go over, he said, and be strong and be courageous. Since the Lord had said that, why will Joshua need to send spies again to go and get information and to survey and to search out the land? That's a lesson for us. When God has given us a commission and a challenge, he tells us what to do. Yet, we're to use our common sense. We're to find all the information necessary. We're to survey. We're to search. As we get all the information that we carry out, then we're able to go right into the assignment. In Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 20. In Proverbs 16, 20, it says, He that handleth a matter wisely shall find good. Whoso trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. We find Joshua here uh, handling the matter wisely. But then, the simple passage before us, that is, uh, they come in, the two spies come into Jericho, getting into the house of Rahab the harlot, and then the king hearing about it, and then sending to Rahab, saying, there are two people that have come to spy the land, bring them out, and then uh, Rahab hiding them, and then telling a lie, and then eventually searching for those people, not finding them, and then going back eventually. That's a simple story. But it's a very difficult passage for many people because it raises a lot of questions. The questions are there on your outline. Why did Joshua even send out spies? Didn't God say, arise and go over? Should he not have acted immediately? Especially when the people had pledged their obedience. With faith in God, did Joshua need to make an investigation at all? 
And why did he send only two spies when Moses at an earlier time had sent 12 spies to search out the land? Why the difference? Why did these Israelite spies go to the house of a Lord? Will the Lord use an unbeliever Rehab to accomplish his purpose? How can he, how can we understand Rehab's unpatriotic action against a native land? Will a lie be justified in the sight of God? Should we do evil that good may come? If the spies had real faith in God, why did they take cover hiding under the stalks of flags, under the roof, upon the roof? Much wisdom is seeding in the whole procedure. And Christian leaders who are working in sensitive areas of the world will learn to receive wisdom. In fact, we are told in Proverbs chapter 9 verse 9, it says, The just shall be taught and will increase in learning. I'm telling you that to be victorious in all our spiritual warfare and to be fruitful in Christian ministry and evangelism and to be successful in capturing Jericho and bringing down the strongholds thereof and to be triumphant over uh, peculiar trials and temptations, we need to read Joshua again carefully and learn prayerfully and wisely apply and, um, and uh, practice what we learn. I want you to come to this passage tonight without any preconceived ideas and pray that God will open your eyes to discover the spiritual truth and the spiritual secret of breakthrough. We're going to divide the teaching into three parts. Number one, the search for useful information. Even the title itself, without even going deep into it, should make sure to understand the search for useful information. Number two, supervision. An unusual illustration. Number three, a series of unrecognized iniquities. What people do, and they do not realize, it is iniquity. A series of unrecognized iniquities. Let's come back to number one. In number one, uh, we're learning about the search for useful information. In Joshua chapter 2 verse 1. Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly. Saying, go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. You remember that God had told Joshua and he had said, you must do according to what Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. Look at the example that he laid down and you do the same. Was that the only thing uh, that will justify Joshua in sending out spies? Let's look at Numbers chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send out men that they may search the land of Canaan. Will you understand then? It was not a carnal procedure. It was not an idea from the flesh. It was not an idea from man. God said unto Moses, Send out men. That they may search out the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers, ye shall send a man, every one a ruler among them. Now they were going to do sensitive work, and therefore they will choose intelligent people, mature people, elderly people. The people that have experience, they will be leaders and elders, rulers among their people. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran, all those that were head of the children of Israel. Let's learn a lesson there. It is wonderful. It is very necessary. When you are doing a new assignment, you are doing something new, that you find all the information necessary. It is important to obtain useful information concerning the promised land, concerning the assignment that you have. And here Joshua, following after the example of Moses, he sent out spies to search out and obtain useful information concerning the city of Jericho. What was the strategic nature of Jericho? It was a gateway into the promised land. God's promise, God's presence, God's power with us is not an excuse, it's not a license to neglect prudence and necessary preparation in performing our duty. What Moses had done in sending out 12 spies, now Joshua was following after the example. Why the difference? Because in the case of Moses, he wanted them to search out the whole land in year 12. In the case of Joshua, they needed to spy out only Jericho, a city. 
And so you understand, 12 spies for the whole land. That's for the whole nation. All those Canaanites, in fact, there were seven nations residing in the land of Canaan. But now in just the city, only two spies were necessary. We need to get all necessary information before embarking on a new assignment. And then we look at Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1. They are in verse 22 and verse 23. And well, he's still repeating the same thing, still telling us how Moses sent out the spies. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 22, verse 23. And he came near unto me, everyone, he came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us. And that they shall search us out the land and bring us word again by the way we must go and into what cities we must come. And the same pleased me well. And I took 12 men of you, one of every tribe. It's saying that the same thing that was in the mind of God, which he told the Moses, the people also, they wanted to do the same thing. And so he said, he sent them out. Although when they came back, they did wrong, and they gave uh, the wrong uh, side of issue. And therefore, they delayed the children of Israel that they could not get into the land. But understand, it was still a wise thing that uh, they sent out the people they sent out. Do we do that today? Let's look at Matthew chapter 1. Matthew, sorry, chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. Then we move on to verse 16. Matthew chapter 1, verse 10. Sorry, chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, verse 16. Behold, I send you forth a sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents, and harmless as doves. The point here is that they are the power to cast out devils. And they are the power to heal the sick. Did not mean that there will be no common sense in their ministry. Did not mean that there will be no wisdom in their ministry. They are the power. They are the unction. They are the anointing. They are the authority. And yet he said, I'm sending you forth a sheep in the midst of wolves. I'm sending you forth, and you will be in the midst of those serpents. You will be wise. You will be wise, and you will be harmless. And therefore, we understand then, we ourselves, as we're getting the work of God done, we need wisdom. May God give us real scriptural wisdom so that the work of God will be done effectively, efficiently in Jesus' name. In Job chapter 29, Job chapter 29, verse 16. It says, I was a father to the poor. Listen to what follows. And the cause which I knew not, I searched out. The cause which you know not, you search out. You are put like a pastor in a new local church. The cause that you know not, search it out. And you are put as a coordinator in a new district. The things that you don't know, search it out. God gives you an opportunity to become a missionary. You get into a nation. Find out everything you can find out about that nation. The cause that you know not, you will search out in Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs chapter 25. Reading there from verse 2. In verse 2 it says, It is the glory of God to conceal a sin, but the honor of the king of kings is to search out a matter. The Lord will not leave every information on the surface. Everything will not be superficial. He will give you the responsibility to dig deep, and it is the honor of the king to search out a matter so that you will know what to do. You will know how to approach the work of the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 18, Every purpose is established by counsel, and with good advice, make war. And you cannot have that good advice without having all the information that you need. Do you see why many people are not able to capture a city? for the Lord. They are not able to capture their territory for the Lord. They are not able to capture their community for the Lord. It's because they do not search. They do not find out what are the informations that are there that we need. That if we have, it will help us to know how to map out our plans and to be able to take the city. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 15. 
Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 15. The labor of the foolish. We raise every one of them. Why? Because he knoweth not how to go to the city. And this is what Joshua was trying to do. He knew that Jericho was standing between them and the land of Canaan. Even if they cross the river Jordan, they'll come at Jericho. And you cannot get into the land of Canaan except you captured Jericho. And if they just started to labor and they just started to march on and to move on without knowing the way to go, they will not be able to capture the city. That's why it says the labor of the foolish weariest, every one of them, they do not know. They have not searched out. They have not got all the information necessary because they know not how to go into the city. We're back in Joshua chapter 1 now. And you will see then that God does not place any premium on ignorance at any time. In order to accomplish what God wants us to do, we must diligently acquire all necessary information, all necessary knowledge for its accomplishment. There can be no effective effectiveness in ministry without some effort. There will be no progress without prudence and preparation. And there will be no extraordinary achievement without using the ordinary gifts God has given us in all areas of life. This uh, passage is teaching us something. Look before you leave. That means, before you cross Jordan, be well informed about Jericho. Before you pass to the other side, once again, remember in all the details of your life and in all the details of ministry, look before you do what? Before you leave. Now we come to point number two. Point number two, supervision and unusual illustration. Well, we're looking at an illustration here in Joshua chapter 2, reading from verse 2. It says, and it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in here tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho said unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. Now, will you see something here? That the king of Jericho, he was very vigilant as a king. He was a watchman over his own people. As a king, he was uh, responsible for the sheep of the fold. And for all the uh, precious souls in that city. Can we learn anything from the vigilance, from the watchfulness, and from the earnestness of the king of Jericho? Yes, we can. And indeed, we must. We too, we are kings and we are watchmen. Over the sheep in Christ's fold. Look at Revelation chapter 1. He was a king over Jericho. And we too were kings over the heritage of the Lord. Over the people of the Lord. In Revelation chapter 1. Verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and a first begotten of the dead, and the prince of uh, the kings of the earth, unto him who has loved us, and washed us from our own from our sins in his own blood and has made us what has made us what has made us kings and priests unto God his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen and so you see as he was a king so we too we are kings not only that we are kings we are watchmen over the people of God in Ezekiel chapter 3 Ezekiel chapter 3 from verse 17. Ezekiel 3. Verse 17. Son of man. I have made thee a watchman. Unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth. And give them warning from me. Do you know that you as a worker. You are a watchman. Over the people of God. Under your leadership. And when we say leaders, there are people that do not understand that uh, if you are a leader in any way, you are a watchman. Uh, you are a leader in the choir, you are still a watchman. It's not just that you bring those uh, brothers and sisters together and just sing. You must be interested in their spiritual life. You are the head usher. You must be interested in the spiritual life, in the families too, of the ushers that are working under your leadership. Whatever work we're doing, you are a leader. You are a watchman as well. You are not only interested that they will do the work effectively. I about their lives. I about their welfare. And I about everything pertaining unto them. We are watchmen in whatever capacity. I was fellowship 
worship leaders, we are watchmen. Zonal leaders, we are watchmen. Women representatives, we are watchmen. And uh, coordinators, I said last week, you are a pastor over that district, we are watchmen. And if you are a group coordinator, of course, we are watchmen. And when we come to the local pastor in a, in a, in a region or local pastor in a local government, we are watchmen over the people in Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 6 and 7. Ezekiel 33, verse 6. But if the watchman see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the people, if uh, the sword come, and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Thou, so thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, thou shalt hear the watch at my mouth, and warn them from me. We shall be very vigilant over the people of God, just like the king of Jericho was uh, vigilant over the people of God. But thank God, we even have a better example, a unique example, an unparalleled example. That is, the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd, the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, and uh, the one that watched over his own sheep. In uh, John chapter 6, John chapter 6, verse 39, here it says, This is the Father's will, that uh, which he has sent me, uh, we, this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all that as he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise up again, should raise everyone up at the last day. Do you understand then that you are a pastor, you are a leader, you are a worker, you are an overseer over that little group, over that, uh, over that uh, flock of God? This is the Father's will. You will watch over them. You will be as vigilant as the king of Jericho was vigilant. Even go beyond the king of Jericho as Jesus Christ was vigilant. You will be vigilant so that the people under your care will not be destroyed. In John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Reading there from verse 12. Well, I was with them in the world. I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. And that's what we should do to you, watching over them. Did you remember uh, when uh, the people came, and they came for Jesus Christ, wanting to arrest him? He said, if you are looking for me, let these ones go. Even at the time that he was facing danger, he was still going to protect his own sheep. That's the lesson we're learning here, that uh, we have this unusual illustration from the king of Jericho, that we as watchmen, we must be vigilant so that we protect the children of God from spiritual danger. We must be prompt in making urgent investigation. If we hear of anything that may threaten the physical and spiritual life of any of the brethren, not only that, anything that will endanger the physical life or the family life, domestic life, Life of any of our brethren, we must uh, be very vigilant. You know, sometimes uh, some of our leaders, uh, if you say that uh, uh, there is a maid living with uh, that family, and that maid is not totally clean, and may create trouble for that family, oh, they say, that's not, that's not my concern. That's not part of my work. My work is only to preach. My work is to emphasize that salvation, that holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. As for their family issues, as for the familiar spirit, uh, whatever it is that comes into their family, they are intelligent enough to be able to take care of themselves. No, you are a watchman. You ought to be concerned about their family life. You ought to be concerned about their children. You ought to be concerned about every soul that is uh, there in every way. In fact, Jesus Christ, in one of the parables, he told when the uh, servants, when they said, how is it that there were tires in the field? He said, look at it in Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 13, it tells us uh, there in that parable in verse 20, Matthew chapter 13, verse 25. But while men slept, his enemy came and so tears among the wheat and went his way. When we sleep as leaders, that's when Satan comes and then he brings the sample chance to plant his children, to plant his emissaries in the church, even to come among the workers. That's the reason why we must not be asleep. We must not uh, uh, be careless over the heritage of the Lord, over the people of the Lord. Is any false doctrine trying to enter? Be vigilant. Fish it out. Root it out. 
a strange fire trying to enter, root it out. Is any strange dressing in coming into the fellowship in your location? Make sure you speak against it, speak in love, but make sure that you deal with it in our personal life too. In our personal and spiritual lives, we must act promptly. Like this king acted, immediately we receive the first alarms of conscience, of the approach of temptation. Very quickly, we nip that danger while still in the boat. Arrest that situation while you may. If you wait, the, the allowance of one sin will lead to another sin, and then another sin, and then another sin, until there is a total defeat and irreparable damage and ruin may be done. Remember the words of Jesus, watch and pray. It's very important that we watch. Very important that we'll not just uh, leave things as they are and we'll be watching. In uh, First Kings chapter First Kings chapter 20. First Kings chapter 20, verse 39 and verse 40. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king and said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle. And behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me and said, Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life go for his life, or else thou wilt pay a talent of silver. And as thy servant was busy here and there, he was gone. Isn't that the experience of many of our leaders? Isn't that the experience of uh, many people? In fact, that happens, uh, you know, to many pastors outside, uh, outside deeper life. Uh, they leave their churches. Uh, today they are in Japan. Tomorrow they are in China. The other time they are in India. The other time they are in America. The other time they are in Europe. And they leave their congregation for about six months. And then eventually before they come back, the congregation start, scatters. That's what the Lord is telling us. While you are busy here and there, and uh, it's not only in the congregations outside deeper life, even over here, sometimes the coordinator is not there. Sometimes the pastors are not there. Sometimes the leaders are not there. And while you are busy here and there, then the people of God will hear that they have gone to that mountain, they have gone to that valley, they have gone to that riverside, they have gone to that shed, they have gone to that new fellowship, they have gone to that other assembly, while you are busy here and there. But when you concentrate, and you know that you are a watchman, and you watch over the sheep, you watch over the flock, you watch over the people of God, then you'll be doing what this king did, vigilant, Honest, supervising, overseeing the work of the Lord as you ought to. We come to point number three now. In point number three, we now come to a series of unrecognized iniquities. This is a serious part now because it's a part that many, many people do not understand. We're looking at it from verse four. And the woman took uh, the, the two men and hid them and said thus, there came men unto me, but I know not, I wish not, whence they were. And it came to pass, about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out, that was a lie. Whither the men went, I know not, he knew where they were, she knew where they were. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house. And hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan unto the forts. And as soon as it, as soon as they were pursued, uh, they which pursued after them were gone. They shut the gates. Now here is uh, the area that you really need to pay attention now, and we need to understand. First of all. We need to understand that we must not do evil that good may result. In Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Verses 7 and 8. Romans chapter 3 verses 7 and 8. For if the truth of God... As more abounded, for if the truth of God as more abounded through my life unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderous, slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil, that good may come, whose damnation 
is just. Here we find the principle of the heathen. The principle of stark unbelievers who do not know God. What's their principle? They say the end justifies the means. They say if you have a good purpose in mind, a good result you are looking for, and you are targeting for something purposeful, something good, and uh, something desirable, even if you do something bad to achieve that good thing, they say that's right. That's what Paul and the apostle is saying here. He's saying they are levying on us, they are putting on us the principles of heathens that will say, let us do evil, that good may be the result. Then he said, the condemnation of such is just. And then he says, if now you say you are a believer, and then you are doing something evil, and you say, but I know why I'm doing it. I know it's evil quite all right. I know it's not right, but I say good purpose in mind. There is a laudable purpose in mind. I'm doing it so that I can achieve that good purpose I have in mind. This is sinful. This is evil. This is unrighteous. This is carnal. This is worldly. But I'm going to do it so that I will achieve a good end eventually. The Bible says your condemnation is just. That's exactly what we see here in the case of Rahab. But before I go too far, let's uh, please understand. Rahab had no Bible to read. Rahab had no religious book, no religious tract, no Christian literature to read. She had no preacher. She had no teacher of God's word of truth. She had, she had only heard of the power of God, the God of Israel, that made them to pass over the Red Sea dry short. That's all she had. She never knew about the righteous principles. All she knew is that God had uh, commissioned these people to come and take over the land. And you cannot compare yourself with Rahab. All the Bible verses you know, you are not the same as Rahab. All the teachings of God, you are not the same as Rahab. The New Testament principles you have, you are not the same as Rahab. The, the commandments of God, you are not the same as Rahab. And the intelligence he has given you, you are not the same as Rahab. And uh, the training you have gone through in the workers' uh, team, you are not the same as Rahab. The knowledge of that holiness without which no man shall see God, you are not the same as Rahab. The teaching you have given to other people, you are not the same as Rahab. You cannot do evil that good may be the result. We have no excuse today. We who have been taught the word of God, we who have been nourished in the word, in the word of faith and of good doctrine, we have no excuse. Please understand a good motive, a good objective, a good end, a good result, a good final thing that we are gunning for, we are targeting, we are aiming at, will never Render a sinful action justifiable, desirable in the sight of God. That's a great lesson that we need to learn. Because there are many, many people that will do evil and listen. When we eventually get to the other side, then the Lord will bring judgment. And then you might want to bring your argument and you say, God, we are the reason for doing that. We knew it was bad. In fact, our pastor, he spoke to us gently. He spoke to us forcefully. He spoke in love. And sometimes we even think he was angry when speaking to us about it. And sometimes he even cried in the moment of his weakness when they did all those things. But we had a good purpose. And it was because of that good purpose we had in mind. That's why we did the evil sin. And then God will tell you that he never sends any man. He never sends any woman to do an evil thing that a good purpose may eventually be achieved. That's why this third part of the message is a series of unrecognized iniquities. You know, there are people that practice iniquities. They don't recognize it is iniquity. They profess they are born again. They profess they are even sanctified. They profess they are baptized in the Holy Ghost. They profess they are faithful to the Lord. They, they profess they are earnestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. And they, they will do it like 
the early Catholic Church and the Jesuits like they did it. They carried the sword against the people to compel people to bow down to what they call Christian principles. They actually literally killed people, tortured people, did much evil so that they'll be able to make the Catholic Church to grow. Originally, they did evil because they thought if we did that, we'll expand the kingdom of God. It's iniquity. They didn't recognize it, and it is still iniquity today if you are doing it and you don't recognize it. In Genesis chapter 31, Genesis chapter 31, from verse 17, Then Jacob rose up and set his sons and his wives upon camels, and he carried away all the cattle and all the goods which he had gotten, the cattle of his getting, which he had gotten in Padan Aram, for to go uh, to Isaac, his father, in the land of Canaan. And Laban went to share his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the images which were her father's. Jump down to verse 22. And it came, and it was told Laban on the third day that Jacob was fled, and he took his brethren with him, and pursued after him seven days' journey. And uh, they overtook him in the Mount Gilead. And God came to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night and said unto him, Take it that thou speak not Jacob, to Jacob, either good or bad. And then in verse 30 now, And now, though thou wouldest needs be gone, because thou sawest, thou saw longest after thy father's house, Yet wherefore as thou stolen my gods? And Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid. For I said, Paradventure, thou wouldest take by force thy daughters from me. With whomsoever thou findest thy gods, thy images, let him not live before, before our brethren. Discern that, that thou, thou what is thine with me. And take it to thee. For Jacob knew not that Rachel had stolen them. And Laban went into Jacob's tent. And into uh, Leah's tent. And into two maid servants' tents. Uh, but he found them not. Then went he out of Leah's tent. And entered into Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the images and put them in the camel's furniture and sat upon them and Laban searched all the tent and found them not and she said to her father let it not displease my lord that's the father that I cannot try so before thee for the, for the custom of women is upon me and he searched and found not the images and then in verse 36 Jacob was wrought and showed uh, with uh, Laban and Jacob answered and said to Laban what is my trespass what is my sin that thou art so hotly pursued after me whereas uh, thou hast searched all my stuff what hast thou found all of all thy household store? Then he says, set it here before my brethren and thy brethren that they may judge between us. Well, the story goes on. Eventually, uh, you know what uh, this woman did? That wasn't right. She too, she told a lie. And she did what she shouldn't have done. And uh, many people, they do like that today. And, uh, you know, as, we, as we're here in the church, this is like a family. And for some weeks and days now, I've been thinking about it. That um, whether you accept it or not, I'm still a watchman over you. And I'm a watchman over your soul. And I'm a watchman over your spirit as well. I don't want anybody to get into judgment before the Lord. I understand some of the things that go on. And I, I sympathize with quite a lot of people here. Because I understand, I read the newspapers myself, even though I do not uh, go out, uh, you know, too often. And you'll think that, you know, the man is ignorant. He doesn't know of the dangers on the street. He doesn't know of all the problems that are going on. If he knew, he will close the meeting in time. You think, I don't know, I know. And that's why you know tonight now, we have uh, cut off the building, the body, so that you'll go and do it in the district. 
I can be intelligent without you having to torment me to become intelligent. I can be wise without you playing any tricks or playing any prank. I can cut short the message if I want to without you doing anything that you will think that if we disturb, if we distract, my brother, my sister, the problem is when we do that, we dishonor the Lord. We dishonor the sanctuary of the Lord. And that pains me at heart. And then the people that are coming in, they do not have any respect anymore for the house of the Lord. That's the thing that bothers me. That's why in those uh, weeks, whether at the retreat or over here, I used to cry. I used to cry because I was sick. Why are these people doing like this? The good may result. I know you have a good purpose in mind. Stop in time so as not to endanger the lives of the people. That's a good thing. At the retreat, stop in time so that the people will eat their dinner early. I understand. I'm an educated person. Because if you eat too late, it disturbs your system. You are not able to digest. I understand. But why I didn't actually change things immediately is because I knew that instead of us behaving like a family, like children to their father, and then you children will come to the father and say, Sir, maybe you don't understand. Look at this problem. If we stop at this time, don't you think, sir, pray about it? Wouldn't it help us? That's what I wanted. That's what I expected. I felt that would be like family life. And then if we come to the Tuesday meeting, if you got a ghost low on the, on the way, and if you saw that the highway, uh, the robbers are, you know, doing some things, operations in your area, and you feel the pastor may not know, just say, uh, you know, you can send the head usher to me. You can send the one moderating in the month to me. You can send the one going to teach her the scripture to me. Whisper to the pastor that, uh, you know, there is something there, there is something here. If we could close early, it will help the lives of our brethren. After all, would I not be concerned for the lives of the children of God if you told me directly? But you know why I wasn't happy? I wasn't happy because many of you were dealing with me like a deaf man. He wouldn't, he wouldn't hear. So, let's knock him this way. Then, why we knock him two, three times? By the time we knock him ten times, he will reason and think, maybe this is what we want. Is that how to deal with your father? I preach salvation to you. I wanted you to get to heaven. I wanted you to make it eventually. I'm laboring on you. I'm putting all my life, everything there. Why are you going to do that? I'm your father. You are my child. You'll come if there is any problem. And without playing any trick, without any of these things that we're doing, without any of the things that disturb. You think I don't know? I know. I'm very, very sharp. I'm sorry to tell you. And I know some of those things. And it used to pain me. But uh, nowadays, um, I'm now thinking and readjusting myself. I'm saying, well, they are just children. Forgive them, Father, because they know not what they do. And, you know, I became so upset and so unhappy at the retreat. And I threatened you I was going to pray and this was going to happen. But when I said that, I said, why did I do that? A father should endure some things from these young children. And then I prayed to God privately. I said, I told them that to threaten them. But, Lord, don't do anything like that. You know, I love you. And I want you to love me too. And I want you to understand, as we're here together, let's walk together. Shall we walk together? I said, shall we walk together? And if you need, if you have any information, give it to me. If you know I'm going to find something, you know, talk to me about it. You can even write a letter to me. But put your name there. Let's be direct with one another. I like to be sincere with you. And I like to be open to you. I like you too to be open to me. Don't let us go to what Rahab did. And then begin to play tricks that will get us into trouble eventually. I pray that everything that we have done ignorantly in the past, the Lord will forgive and overlook everything in Jesus' name. Give me a louder amen. amen. Now we're going to march on. I said we're going to march on. I'm, my time is going already. I'm going to prove to you that I know you need to go in time. Rise up now and let us pray. Let's talk to the Lord. Let's act like children, members of the family together. I love you and I'm serving you. Love me too and serve me. Don't play tricks. Don't tell lies. Don't deceive. Those unrecognized iniquities, let's bury them. Let there be a new life, a new disposition, a new attitude. It doesn't pay. As I've told you so plainly and so, uh, so clearly, if we're still going to do it, it's not necessary. Not necessary. Even some of you coordinators, I see you do it. I recognize it. And some of you workers, I recognize it. 
Let's apologize to the Lord that he will forgive. You don't even need to come to me to make restitution. I forgive you because uh, we don't need to go through all that trouble. Let's just, uh, you know, turn over a new leaf and let there be a new change. And let us march on now and move on now in the way of the Lord. Don't do evil that good may be the result. 